Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to be here with you on this beautiful day here in the valley. So, um, here at Valley Fellowship, uh, one of the ways that we describe the path of a disciple uh, is with our mission, which is to grow deep, go out, and make disciples. Uh, and what we've chosen to do is uh, we've chosen to, to divide the year into three quadrimesters, um, uh, four months each. And each of the four months of the year, we take, uh, uh, we focus on one of those parts of discipleship, on growing deep in our relationship with Jesus, um, not just having a superficial spirituality and connection, uh, on going out and serving, uh, being Jesus' hands and feet, and finally on helping others, making disciples, mentoring and investing deeply in people to help them to live and know, live for and know Jesus. So we're in this section of um, our year where we're focusing on going out, serving, being the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus says, go ye therefore. And so what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to actually um, do what we did last week, and that was instead of having a sermon where I talk a lot and you talk a little, we're going to have a Bible study where hopefully we, we all talk some. Uh, that's the goal, okay? So uh, last week we took some time to go through and we studied. Does anybody remember what we studied? Hmm. We studied Jesus. Well, we did talk about him. Uh, there was a certain passage. Gospel of John, chapter 14. We looked especially at verses 11 and 12 where Jesus says, um, If whoever believes in me, the works that I'm doing, he will do also an even greater works. And we just spent some time going through a method of Bible study called Observation, Interpretation, Application, and looking at that passage together. And it was fun, wasn't it? It was a blessing. I, I left learning some things and um, uh, touched, uh, touched by the Spirit. We're going to do the same thing today. We're going to go through the parable of the talents um, that uh, was so uh, graciously read, uh, and we're going to use this Bible study method, observation, interpretation, application. If you have one of these guides, uh, this will be helpful to you. And let me just explain um, how this is going to work, and then we'll pray together and we'll dive in. So um, one of the things that we're told to do often is to study the Bible, but we're not often told how. To do that. And if you haven't noticed, the Bible is a complicated, sometimes strange, oftentimes confusing, yet absolutely amazing book. How do we actually study the Bible in a way that not only we can understand it, but it can get a hold of us and change us and change our lives and our families and our communities and our world? Um, this method of Bible study was not something I came up with. It was taught to me um, when I was a staff at Flag Camp, and um, it has been a blessing to me. And it's simply a way to dig into the text, understand its meaning, and how that meaning applies to us. Um, so we're going to, uh, after we pray, we're going to spend some time um, writing out some of the verses um, this is just a, a very good step to help us notice and observe what the text actually says. You know, when uh, we talked about this last time, when a king um, was anointed in Israel, they were supposed to write for themselves a copy of the book of the law. They weren't just supposed to say, hey, scribe, go write for me a copy of the law. Uh, the... God's instruction was very specific that they were to write for themselves a copy of the law. Why were they supposed to write it with their own hand? Well, you can learn a lot more, right? You can notice a lot more um, rather than just reading something. If you were to write it with your hand, you're going to notice and understand and be familiar with that in a, in a much greater way. So we're going to just do a little bit of that. We're going to pick out a few verses, write them with our own hand. Then we're going to spend some time observing 
How can we be changed by the Bible if we don't pay attention to what it actually says, right? It's not a magical book in the sense that just reading the words um, just somehow magically will, will, will change us. No, it's the message of the Bible through the Holy Spirit that changes us. And so to be changed by that message, we have to pay attention to what it actually says. So we're going to spend some time observing what the Bible says, paying attention, noticing the details in the text. And then we're going to spend some time interpreting. And interpretation isn't just what you think the Bible means, right? Because ultimately, 8 billion people on the world, there might be 8 billion different interpretations. Really, interpretation, we're not trying to get at what do you think the Bible means, but what did God intend it to mean, right? What is the intended message and meaning of the text as written down by the original author as they sought to be understood by those that they were writing to in, the, in their first context. So that's the interpretation that we're going to spend some time with. And then finally, we will look at application. What difference does it make? How does this truth, this message, this passage have any relevancy, any impact on my life? How should I live differently now that I know what I have seen, what I know? And that application isn't just for us personally, but what is our mission as a church? How can we take this truth and bless those around us, bless the community, live this out? So we're going to spend some time doing this. I encourage you, if you haven't done so, um, not right now, but sometime go home and just read through uh, this guide. Um, in the beginning section, there's just an explanation of these steps, um, observation, interpretation, application, and then... There's an example of how somebody might go about doing this. We're looking at the parables of the, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. There's just an example written out of observation, interpretation, and application. And then finally in the back, there's a blank section. And I hope today as we go through these steps that you will write some things down and take some notes. And that we will all learn together by God's grace and through the Holy Spirit. So let me pray, and then we're going to jump in, okay? God, we thank you for your word. It's powerful. It's amazing. There is no other book like it. We pray that today your word would be mingled with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that it would get into our hearts and our minds, it would transform our lives, and that the end of this, that the result would be that we are more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, parable of the talents. If you've got your guide here, we're going to start in this section rewrite or retell. And what I would like you to do, we're going to give you some quiet time. I'd like you to pick one or two verses from the parable of the talents. So verses 14 to 30. Pick one or two verses to write out by your own hand. Doesn't matter which translation you want to use. You can uh, pick, pick one. Uh, write it out. Or if you choose, instead of writing out word for word those verses, you can try to retell or rephrase, summarize the parable in your own words. Okay? So those are the options. Hopefully you've got something to write with. Does everybody have one of the guides? We're going to give you a few minutes. Either rewrite a few verses or try to rephrase phrase, summarize the parable in your own words. You've got three minutes. Go. So, hey, how are you? Welcome. So we are going through a Bible study, Matthew 25, from verses 14 to 30, the parable of the talents, and we're using this guide.
tonight and giving you just one more minute. You're rewriting or retelling, rephrasing. So what verse did you choose to rewrite, for those of you who rewrote a verse? Anybody want to share? You can just say the number of the verse. You did the first one, verse 1, or f- verse 14. Mm-hmm. Verse 29, that's the one I did. Kind of feels like the punchline, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. 22 and 23. Any others? 28, okay, yeah. Um, you don't have to say what you noticed, but raise your hand if you noticed something new in the verse as you were rewriting it. Did anybody notice something new as you were rewriting it? Okay. So what we're going to do now, we're going to spend some time observing the text. And let me tell you, For most of us, this is the hardest part, to slow down and pay attention and actually notice what the text says. We are so ready to jump to the interpretation or the application or the meaning that often we just run right over the details of the text. But how can you know what it means if you don't actually pay attention to what it says? So what we're going to do, we're going to divide. You can do this in your row or you can turn around to to people around you. Uh, In groups, I would suggest group sizes of four, five, six people. Um, If you get bigger than that, it might get a little bit harder. But um, uh, no hard and fast rules here. But you're going to divide into a group. Spend some time reading the text and then simply paying attention and sharing with others details in your group, sharing with those in your group the details that you notice in the text, okay? Let me just give you an example. In the text, there are two specific emotions that are mentioned. What are those emotions? Okay, that's a detail to observe. Also, I want you as you're observing, not just to observe the details of the text itself, but think about the context, you know, what comes before, what comes after, where are we in the story uh, of Jesus here in the gospel, what has just happened, what's about to happen. Notice some of the context in which this parable is given. All right, do you guys understand your assignment? Okay, so we're going to give you about 10 minutes to do this. You're going to find a group, spend a little time reading together, and then spend some time observing. Don't go to interpretation. Don't go to application. I'll come around with a wet noodle if you do. (laughs) Just pay attention to the details there in the text. All right? Okay, you can divide and gather into groups. Hi, my name is Reed. Regine, welcome. We're so glad you're here. So I.
About two more minutes in your group. Two or three more minutes. Write down your observations. So he says, you can be wealthy like none other, but you can give like none other also. Well, it does. It says, it, it says you know, test me and see if you want to give. I got your back if you just let me. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily be wealthy to give exactly. either. <laughs> All right, go ahead and finish up in the last minute. 
share any final observations, write them down. All right. It does my heart good to see you guys reading and talking about and getting into the text together. I think this is one of the things that we should be doing as the people of God when we come together. So we're going to take just a moment to share some of our observations, okay? So uh, we've got Stacy and Ron here with microphones. We just request that everybody, when you talk, um, we know you can hear yourself, but we just want to make sure everybody else hears the wonderful things you have to say. And also, you know, we are recording to, to put on YouTube. So if you could talk in the microphone um, uh, and wait for the microphone, that would be helpful. So let's start by sharing some observations. And what I want to start with um, is not the verses... Uh, Matthew 25, 14 to 30, but I want to start with, a little bit with the context, okay? Did anybody observe the context? Where are we in the story of Jesus? What's, uh, what's happened before this? What's going to happen after this? What is the context of Matthew 25? Does anybody want to share with us? Uh, did your group uh, mention or notice anything about the context? Okay, Donna over here. They're talking about the signs of the end of the time. Ah, okay. So Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is about what? It's about the second coming, right? Um, okay. Matthew 26. What happens in Matthew 26? And uh, what kind of supper is it? The what supper? The last supper. Why do we call it the last supper? So Jesus, this is the, the, the movements that end up with Jesus at the cross and then the tomb, right? So um, Jesus is going to be um, betrayed and arrested. And in fact, um, I think chapter 26, the very first thing Jesus says in 26, isn't it something like the Son of Man's going to go and be crucified? And um, so Jesus is announcing, this is it. This is the time. This is, you know, we're, uh, this is all happening. Okay, so we have chapter 25. Isn't this interesting? Uh, chapter 25 is sandwiched between a chapter about Jesus' second coming when he's going to come back, and chapter 26 is really the starting of him leaving, his death and his resurrection and his ascension, right? And chapter 25 is in between those two things. And by the way, do we have those sorts of themes in the parable of the talents? Leaving and coming back? Oh, okay, okay. All right, um, so uh, that's the larger context what about the immediate context? What else is happening in chapter 25? What did you notice? Did anybody talk about this? I know one group in the back was talking about this. What else, what else is going on in Matthew chapter 25? Okay, we have the parable of the virgins. What else? Talents, that's the one we're studying, and sheep and goats. Are there some common themes that we see in all three of those parables? What do you notice that is common that connects the parable of the virgins, the talents, and the sheep and the goats? that connection with the Savior, and some don't. Okay, so in each of these parables, there's really two outcomes, right? right. There, there's not three or four, there's two. Yeah, 
Ready or not. That's okay. Let's say it that way. Ready or not. Those are the two outcomes. Those who were not ready, were they not ready because of something they did or because of something they didn't do? Oh. All three parables, the criticism, maybe is that the right way to say it? I don't know. The problem. Okay, let's do that. Ooh, could somebody get me something to erase with? On the back of the of this. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. All right. All right. And again, I apologize for my handwriting. Worst grade I ever got in school was handwriting. Problem is what they didn't do. Now, this is interesting. In all three of these parables, is the master there when the servants are doing or not doing what, what's going on? Oh. So the master comes back. And the problem is what wasn't done. All right. Now, we're not going to get quite into interpretation yet, but you, you can see how it dang, we're dangling our toes, right, in interpretation, right? And by the way, when you pay attention to the details, when you observe, it'll lead you right into interpretation. You don't have to start guessing, oh, what does this mean? What, what's he trying to say? If you pay attention and notice, it will lead you there. Okay, all right, so that's the larger context. Let's take some time now and share our observations of what happens in the parable of the, the talents. So now we're focusing on verses 14 to 30. What are some details, words, ideas, themes, events? What did you notice in the text um, that you shared with your group. Okay, so we got a hand over here. Donna's going to share. Okay, do you want to say it or me? Okay, I'm going to say what Pamela said because this is, this is eye-opening for me. In verses 14 and 15, he gives them according to their own ability, which means he had a relationship with his oh. servants. Okay, he knows them. And that was Pamela's idea, and it was so eye-opening for me. Yeah, I love it. So the master knows the servants and their abilities. And he gives accordingly. Okay. Good. Good observation. Got another observation here yeah that the master trusted his servants ah okay the master trusts and maybe this is a good place to talk about this uh when we use the word talent we think of skill or ability now if we say that that's what it means in the parable that's our modern right in the time of jesus in the context of first century Judaism and the, the Roman world, what was a talent? It was money. Do you know how much money it was? Okay, Rob. Get so so I, I didn't stick to the text. I kind of did a little research. But okay. So 20 years of uh, what a laborer would make was one talent. So 6,000 drachmas was a unit of measure in that time. So uh, think about that. One talent, 20 years worth of labor. So in today's, what are we talking, wow. like a lot? Yeah. 600,000 maybe or something? Yeah, so think money. about this. One talent is 6,000 drachma or denarii. One denarii equals what a Roman soldier was paid for a day's labor. Now, not everybody was as well off as the Roman soldiers, right? So this is 
this is pretty good. This is a livable wage. This is, you know, um, people would be very happy with this. One talent, 6,000 days wages. Stacy. Well, me and myself and I back here were talking. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> but I, I, what to go along with this, uh, the master obviously had an expectation uh, as well, and it was kind of unspoken, mm. right? But the servants must have known uh, of the expectation. Yeah. Okay. So mas the master has a trust, and we're going to make this an and expectation. Um, and he gives them a lot <laughs> of money. I mean, we're talking a lot of money, right? Okay, so there's, there's a trust, but there's this expectation. And um, maybe we'll get to it a little bit, but that expectation seems to be tied to a certain knowledge. All right, go ahead. And I, I think the second part to that, Stacy, is that the, the text says that they immediately went ah. and, you know, put the money to work. Right. So not only did the master have an expectation, but the servants, presumably, also had, you know, they, they knew. They, they knew understood. what to do with it. They understood. They understood, understood. Yeah. right. Yes. So the two servants, there's not confusion. They're not sitting around, oh, what am I supposed to do with this? They... They know. They may not have known when he was returning. Right. Well, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to give us the, the idea that they don't know um, when he returns. Yeah. All right. All right. What else did you notice? I don't know if this means anything, but it, it did pop out to me that it sounds like he delivered all his goods to them. Like, it oh. doesn't sound like he kept anything back. Wow. So, the master is giving everything. Um, very interesting. We could get into interpretation really quickly there, but we will keep going with observation. All right, uh, we got a hand somewhere back here. Okay, wait for the mic. Enough, you say He was he was saying that the man with the one talent that did nothing with it and just handed it back to the master was talking to the master in more of an accusatory way. Oh. Instead of like, I'm sorry, I didn't do nothing, you know, instead of humbleness or whatever. Yeah. He was just like ah, talking okay. to the master. So the a, one servant. Like now this is kind interesting. of putting the blame on the master almost. Right. What did you expect me to do? You're a hard man. You're doing this and this and what, you know, he's, he's, yeah. Um, uh, that's very interesting. Look to your left. To my left. Okay, yes, Farah. When he was handing out the talents, he wasn't handing out to professionals. It wasn't mentioned that they were investors or bankers or any kind of professional. These are he servants. was giving it to the ordinary guy, telling mm. them to go out. This kind of goes along with the servants, right? Um... The servants and not professionals. Interesting. Yes, Melody. Uh, we also noticed that the man with the one talent admitted to being afraid and sometimes ah. fears paralyzing. Yes. So the the uh, remember we we said there was two emotions. The emotion that motivates the one servant is what? Fear. And notice, what was he afraid of, or who was he afraid of? He's afraid of the master, which leads him to not serve the master as the master intended or wanted. 
Does the master think that the servant knows him? Tell me why. Yeah, he says, if you thought I was such a hard man, reaping where I don't sow, well, why didn't you put the money to work? Okay, so the one servant has fear of the master. We don't know that, um, but we know what he says. He says he's afraid. Now, by the way, maybe we should mention this here. What did the master say that the servant could have done instead of sticking the one talent in the ground? Put it with the bankers. Now, what did the two servants do that doubled their money? Traded. I used to always think that the two servants put the money with the bankers. That's not what it says, actually. In fact, this week, as I was reading the text and trying to observe and listen to my own advice and pay attention, I was like, oh, it doesn't say they put it with the bankers. It actually says that they went and traded, which, if you think about it, is a little more risky, right? Trading takes work, and there's risk. Does the master seem to be upset at them for taking risk? In fact, the one who, out of fear, doesn't take the risk. So the master is not adverse to risk, we could say. Okay. All right. Um, another, another observation is that they all got something. Some got less, some got more, yes. but they all got something. They were all yes. expected to do something. Everybody gets something. We're going to run out of room here. I'm going to put that up here with his trust. Okay. And uh, JC. I noticed that the two servants who did invest the money and traded and all of that, they got different results. One got five extra talents, one got two extra talents but they had the exact same reply mm. from the master. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Yeah. Even though the results were different. Ah, well done. All right, so this is the... So the two servants both get a well done. And then what's, what's the invitation that follows? Yeah, um, come and share whose joy? My joy. So their path to joy, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? Their path to joy was through the master's joy. All right, yes, Michael. So I've read this parable a number of times, and I had never realized this, and we were discussing this. So with the, the, uh, the lazy stu uh, student, Lazy the student. lazy <laughs> servant says, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered or scattered seed. I had always interpreted that as the master going out and harvesting, like essentially stealing oh. where he had not planted or, you know, sowed. And it was brought up that, I mean, his servants were the one that were planting mm -hmm. and sowing. It wasn't him. So I don't know if that's worth mentioning, but yeah. it was something that new that I didn't realize before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the Genie. The man with the one talent, again, <laughs> um, he probably wanted to be blessed as much as the other two, mm. but like Nate was saying, too much is given, much is required. He couldn't handle the little. Why would he be given the much? Mm. Right, right. So he's he ends up being disappointed because he's 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 buried that that money. All right, yes, George. The two that had the five and the two talents. Uh huh. One did not bring back more than the other. They both doubled. Uh huh. 
so they were both at 100%. The master knew these people when he gave them the talents to start with. So he knew what they were going to do mm -hmm. ahead of time. And because the one didn't trust, didn't like him, didn't trust him, or had uh, the fear and perhaps even laziness. But the talents were doubled. Yeah. So the master knows the servants. The question is, do they know the master? Right. Very good. All right. Uh, somewhere? Stacy's pointing to somebody. I had something to say, and it left me. It vanished. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have any more space to write, so can I ask, uh, whatever good uh, ideas you have. Can I ask a question? Oh, yes. Is there a difference in, in the, the words that are chosen uh, between traded and gained? The one with five talents traded and, gained f and, and, and received five more. The second one that was given two gained two more. Is there any difference in those words? I, I read it That's in both King James and New King James, and they're stated the same way. I'm just curious yeah. if there's a difference. I don't have... You, it uses gained in both places. I don't have the, the Greek with me right now, so I can't. I can't. So look I at remembered what I was trying to say. Yes. Um, so I was curious, and I guess the parable doesn't say, but the two faithful servants are busy for the master. And I was wondering, was the other guy busy for himself? Uh, what's he doing during this time that the money is just sitting in the ground? That's a good question. Maybe that's what the master's wondering. What have you been up to all this time? Okay. Scott's going to share something, then we're going to move to interpretation. Okay. One, one more observation is that one-third of the servants was unfaithful. Two-thirds were faithful. Ah. I was thinking of that in the in context of, like, Revelation, a third of the stars. And, oh, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. Never made that connection in my life before. Very interesting. All right. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go over to interpretation, okay? I want you, you're going to go back to your groups. But let me just remind us, when we say interpretation, we're not saying what do we think it means from our 21st century perspective, all right? So when we're getting to interpretation, we're trying to find out the intended meaning of the author to the original audience. So when Jesus spoke these words, when Matthew wrote them down, when those at that time heard them or read them, how were they intended to be understood in that context? So when we, again, an example of this is when we read the word talent, we think of skill or ability. Well, that's not what the word talent meant. In fact, we, the reason that we define a talent as skill or ability is because of our interpretation. Of, that's where the, the, that definition came from, the, the Christian interpretation of this passage. But at that time, it meant money. Now, it has an implication, and maybe the implication is skill or talent, um, but that uh, it, but that's an interpretation. We need to ask ourselves, is that how they intended the original audience to understand what they were saying. Okay, so you're going to take some time in your group to share together your thoughts on the meaning and message of this parable. What, what is Jesus trying to convey to us, to his audience? What is the meaning and the message? So you're going to get about four minutes together, and then we'll all share. So you can divide back into your groups again.
sure. Yeah. properly because I'm going to demonstrate if you hold it like this it works but if you hold it down it yeah. and also to keep it a little closer yep I'll, I'll do it or you can yeah, yeah. disagree with what he just said because I think the Lord in writing the Bible knew what this day and age a talent would mean. Give you another minute. Oh, it gets, <laughs> yes, self-control. <laughs> well, you can see how these, they flow into each other, right? I mean, you, once you get to interpretation and you're there, oh, I mean, you know, it, it, it's good. It's good that you're.
You have 30 seconds. Okay, if I could have your attention this way, this is fun to watch, you engaging your hearts and your minds in God's Word. Some of you have been talking to me about the tension. Once you're in observation, it's hard not to get over to interpretation, right? And then once you're in interpretation, it's hard not to get over to application. And these things should flow one into the other. Okay, very quickly, before we share, I just need to do a, a public service announcement on behalf of our AV team. <laughs> the right way to hold a microphone in the wrong way, okay? <laughs> Don't grab it down here on the receiver, because this is how it's going to communicate to the back. Transmitter, yes. Don't hold it away. Grab it in the middle, hold it close, then we will all be blessed by what you have to say. So let's start talking about interpretation a little bit. Um, the master, who did Jesus expect those who are listening to him to understand the master to be? Yeah, right? Do we all agree? Yeah. The master is Jesus. The master's leaving and his return. How did Jesus expect those who are listening to him to understand the master's leaving and his return? Okay, uh, you didn't say it with a microphone, so it doesn't count. <laughs> you don't get any stars in your crown. It was to represent Jesus leaving earth and then returning to earth. Okay, so we're talking about the ascension of Jesus. Oh, I don't know how to spell that. Ascension and second coming. You guys get the idea. Okay, are we all so far? Good? All right, the servants of the master. Okay, now, wait a minute. Us is application. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, but, it, I mean, I, I get you. We're with, we're with you. How did Jesus understand, want his listeners to understand who the servants would be? They would say, the servants in the parable are the disciples, disciples of Jesus, right? Now. If you consider yourself to be a disciple of Jesus today, we would fall in that category. So Jeannie's not wrong. She's just a little ahead of us. <laughs> all right. Now, we're all together so far? The talents. This might get a little more tricky, huh? Okay. Does that mean that we're respectfully if, disagreeing with okay. you? Okay. What, whatever you say has to be said in a microphone to get credit in heaven. So, <laughs> all right. We got, uh, so Ron is saying we're d disagreeing. Christina? Just listening to Rob's explanation, your explanation of how much money that was, hmm. I wonder for the audience that he was speaking to, it sounded like an overwhelming responsibility. Ah. Okay. So could we all agree that the talents in some form or another represent 
a responsibility, yeah. right? Yes. But it's not just a responsibility. Responsibility. Because that responsibility comes when we receive a, a gift, a stewardship. Something yeah. is placed in our hands that we are not deserving of but become responsible for, right? Responsibility of stewardship, we could say that. So with the responsibility would be also ability. Uh, and ability is not just financial things right, that we right, have, right. but also tools that we, we've been given. So, so money could represent a, it represents an ability to do something, right? All right. How about knowledge? Ah. Actually, he's been teaching them for three years now, right. plus. And they had knowledge now to share as an experience. Right. So think about what if Jesus is the master, his servants are his disciples, what has Jesus been placing in their hands for the last three and a half years? And wouldn't this connect with what Linda is saying, he has been giving them a knowledge and truth of himself and the world and God that they did not have before. And it was not just a little trickle, right? Talents, bags of gold worth of truth. Examples. Oh. So now they're also they're also the beneficiary, Ron, is saying of examples. They are seeing Jesus doing things that nobody has ever seen anybody else do before. So the talents could be spiritual gifts. They were told to wait until they received the gift that God was mm -hmm. going to send, right? Christ breathed on them, so received the Holy Spirit. So then they were to use those gifts in their service. Yes. Yeah. Jesus gives, he gifts his disciples through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, very real spiritual gifts that they are to be responsible for and use. So could we summarize the talents this way? Tell me if you think this is a fair summary. The talents are to be understood as whatever the master has placed in your hands. Would you agree with that? Yes. Now, that could be literal money, could be truth, ability, knowledge, gifts, time, health. I mean, whatever the master has placed in your hands. Okay. <laughs> so let's do this. We already went beyond. I have, I have something else. If we're talking about the disciples in this interpretation, we're also talking about their unique abilities, each one. Yes. We had some that were more on the finance side, clearly. We had some that were more on the you know, medical side or healing side. So I think you know, it, it makes it, uh, the next step a little closer to our present day if we can think about you know, the abilities of each disciple as yes. being different and unique. Um, what the master the puts parable. in each person's hands is not the same. Mm -hmm. He is giving right. different things to different servants. In fact, I should say in his servants' hands. Here. Okay. All right. Oh, man, there's so much good stuff here, so little time. All right, uh, who are we? Christina. I was just going to say it's interesting that it's different things to everyone that you can't copy anyone else mm -hmm. in what they're doing because you have something different. Yeah. By the way, was there any servant who didn't get anything? No. No. That's interesting, isn't it? Okay, uh, Scott, uh, and then Donna, and then Jeannie, and then Melody. <laughs> An observation on the interpretation. Yes. Christ came as a servant with gifts that were given him from the Father 
And as he used those gifts for gain, he's asking his servants to do likewise. Jesus was away from the Father, using what the Father, and you know, Jesus says, all the, the words that I speak are not mine, they come from the Father. The works that I do are not mine, they come from the Father. Jesus is this servant, serving the master who's not there with him, but he's being this faithful servant while he's away from the master. That's, that's beautiful. Amen. Donna. So I'm going to go off of what Christina said because I really liked that, where he gave all his goods to them, mm -hmm. which meant everything they needed. It was his whole property, which God gives to us, mm -hmm. and it takes all of us to complete the picture yeah. of all of our gifts, time, talents, everything to work together. Okay. Now hold on, Jeff, for a second. Could the master get everything that he was hoping if all of his servants didn't work for him? It took all of the servants working together, each according to what they had received, for the master to receive what he was hoping for. And we've talked about this, some of these similar ideas before, haven't we? All right, Melody. So... The servant with the one talent that was kind of reacting in an accusatory manner, um, he was blaming the, the master and just not realizing that the master had his best interest in mind. Um, it kind of, it just reminds me of when you don't have a relationship with God, mm -hmm. You don't see that. You don't see that he has a plan for you, and you view him maybe as using you mm -hmm. and reaping what he didn't sow, mm -hmm. when in all reality he's investing in you and he's ah. trying to help you to grow. So this is a, an amazing point, actually. He's, he's, he's giving these servants the responsibility of these talents, this incredible responsibility. That action was a path forward for them, right? It was an opportunity for success and reward and joy and not just a burden for them to work. Yeah, that's beautiful. Absolutely. All right, Farah. So in sense, he was telling them to go grow deep, go out, and make disciples. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, that's application, but yes, I love it. Amen. Okay, Donna again. No, you got to wait for the mic. <laughs> he gave, it was their choice what they got to do with it. Mm -hmm. it, it, it he was, doesn't tell them. He, he doesn't tell them what to do. You, mm -hmm. We got a choice. And, and Sharon was saying to us, she was really sad for the one that didn't yeah. and that she's always felt bad when re she reads this. Mm. And we t said, but the, that servant had a choice. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to go Joel, and then we're going to have to kind of pull this together here. Joel. I was just going to say in, in all the parables, the master um, comes back after a long time almost unexpectedly, mm -hmm. but it says, like in verse 19, uh, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled the accounts with them. So it's the master is the one who settles the accounts. Yeah, so let's say this. The settling of accounts, and you can see this in all three of the parables. This is judgment at the end, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't this how Jesus would expect his disciples to understand this? This is a, there's a judgment that is going on, um, and accounts are being settled. Christina, I'm so, not going to let you talk. Sorry, <laughs> I do have a microphone. You do have a microphone, but we got we to gotta move on. There's so many good stuff. Okay, so let's do this. We're going to have a meal together afterwards. Take some of these ideas and share them, because we got to get to application, and I know your idea is like, it's like, worth like a billion dollars it's really great but i'm not gonna let you talk all right so <laughs> this is for application i know okay go well, hold on hold on hold on let's close off interpretation then we're gonna get to application can we summarize together 
this message. Can we do it this way? You tell me if, if you think this is a good summer. We can, or, or we'll just, okay. Jesus has left, but will return in the meantime his disciples are to find joy by using whatever he has given them for his, capital H, joy. You think that's a pretty good summary or what? Would you add to it, change it? I mean, some, something else you could say is that Jesus is saying waiting means working, right? In all of these parables, we see that, you know, it's those who didn't buy the oil, who didn't, you know, in, uh, didn't invest in trade, who um, didn't, you know, uh, feed the poor and the hungry and the sick and visit those in prison. Those are the ones that are, you know, so waiting for Jesus isn't sitting around. Waiting for Jesus means working for him. Mm. All right. Let's go over to application. Christine is going to share now with permission <laughs> From the powers that be, your idea about application? Did you have an idea about application? Oh. What do you guys think? Should we let her share? <laughs> Just what Donna said about Sharon being sad about the one servant, it just occurred to me that the kingdom of heaven suffers eternal loss mm. when we do not work for the master. Yeah. I think the master was sad too, probably. Yeah. Okay. Application. One of the great ways to do application is simply ask a question. Okay. This question could be an am I question. Am I, do I, does anybody want to venture to ask a question that's application based on the message and meaning that we've just talked about. Jeannie. Am I using the spiritual gifts that God has given me in my home, in my community, at work, at church? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Am I using what God has given me, the gifts that God has given me? Amen. Rob. Uh, am I serving the master? Am I serving the master? Do I know his will? Amen. Amen. I think you left one thing off the list. Will I? Ah, will I is great. Do I trust God? Ah. Enough to invest in what he's given me to help his people. Ian. I don't really need this thing, but uh, just to tag on to what she said, will I trust God in regards yeah. to this, the, you know, the servant with the one talent? Amen. Can I add, do I know God? Yeah. Does fear in a wrong knowledge of the master keep me from doing what he wants me to do do I find joy do I find my joy in working for the joy of the master anybody else am I a follower of the master and if so how do I show it yeah how do I show it? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? 
Ah, am I ready? Am I trusting that his plans for me are for my good? Ah. Or am I fear a- and am I trusting that his blood covers yeah. my sins or am I fearing the judgment? Yeah. Do I feel like the master is just trying to use me or does he have my good in mind? Yeah, amen. Do I love him? Yeah. Yeah, amen. 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 Can I, s- I talk too much, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't lie, Stacy. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. There's another purpose for that, but okay. <laughs> um, well, I was just thinking, you know, do we trust God enough to not look at our own ability and our own thinking, the way we think things need to be done, or even look at do we have what it takes to do something with what God has given us? Do we trust him enough to just look at him mm. and, and, and know that if he gave it to us, it's because he knows that with him giving us the strength, we can do it. Yeah, amen. And Jeannie, I love what you're saying, and maybe we can go down here to mission, mission thinking about our larger community. Do we value in our community the servants who have one talent? Do we encourage those who have one talent, or do we just cheer on the two and the five and the... Do we give place and opportunity for all of the servants to serve? Am I allowing fear to keep me from using my talents for God? Amen. It's a great question. It's a great question. Okay. So I hope that today was not only enjoyable, but I hope that, one, that this passage has a deeper meaning and a greater significance for us. Um, And then I hope that you can see the value in taking this method of study. You can do this by yourself. You can do this in a group. I love to do it with a journal in the mornings and just write it out um, to observe, to interpret, and to apply God's Word together. So we're going to pray here um, after our closing song. Um, But let's, let's take these lessons, not just from the parable, but from the exercise, and uh, use them for Jesus.